Thanks, everyone. This, this talk is called, and can you hear me OK? Oh, no, I'm, in, I'm mic'd here. This, this talk is called Conceptualizing Non-Human Intelligence, Anthropomorphism, and Ontology. Now, this is going to be a very traditional kind of humanities talk and that I'm going to read it. It's, um, it's probably for an academic talk, not that heavy, but I think for this context, it'll be a little heavier. So, you know, it requires some attentive listening, but also uh, just let your imagination go when if, if, you know, you get lost in some of the twists. Um, I'm just going to jump into this. Uh, the, the publication this summer of the draft version of the Schumer Disclosure Amendment has brought UAP vehicles further into respectable public discourse than ever before. Even if the legislation should fail to pass this winter, it has given the terminology of UAP non-human intelligence and technology of unknown origin, the imprimatur of the majority leader of the US Senate, and it's made them a matter of significance not only to Congress, but the office of the president, and most importantly, the people on whose behalf the legislative and executive branches govern. Such an astonishing and still to most people unanticipated development is perplexing, not only for its confirmation of things that are supposed to belong only to fiction, but because it raises an ontological problem, a problem concerning a radically unfamiliar kind of existent or being, and the bearing of that existent on our understanding of all other beings, and that disturbs our categories of thought. Now, it's compulsive questioning that tells us when we face a genuine such problem and provides us with an initial means of defining it. And the questions of people unsure of whether UAP are not of human provenance are raised repeatedly, despite the embarrassment they cause. Who or what is it that makes and operates them? Where might they come from? Why do they have a terrestrial presence? What do they want? And are they threatening or perhaps beneficial in some way to human and other living beings? As absurd as such questions may sound, and I acknowledge that entirely, no one today should feel ashamed to pursue them if the majority leader of the Senate has sponsored legislation concerning NHI. Yet anyone looking for insightful, let alone accurate answers, is going to be disappointed. It's not just that we presently lack professional researchers in established academic subfields who can methodically answer these questions. Nor is it that the publicly available data often comes from witnesses to UAP events, and thus in a form the natural sciences are often ill-equipped to handle. There is another more daunting obstacle to arriving at answers, which is so great that it amounts not only to a scientific or intellectual issue, but also to a genuine philosophical problem. And by philosophical problem, I would mean it's, a, it's the kind of problem that forces us not just to ask or find the right questions, but to ask the best way to ask questions at all. That problem is that most of us concerned with UAP are attempting to anticipate through our own concepts of ourselves and our world, beings whose intelligently non-human and radically other character should cause us to bracket or forget for a bit those concepts and the notion of reality they give us. In other words, we inquire into so-called NHI in an anthropomorphic way by presuming that some of our fundamental categories, such as technology, nature, and life, and the analogies we draw on their basis are adequate for anticipating whatever or whomever NHI might be. Now, if that doesn't strike you as a problem, then I would ask you to remember how useless many of the ideas you have of other people and the analogies you draw between them uh, between yourself and them proved to be. And that's to say nothing of the failure of those you draw to make sense of groups and collectives that confound you. If other people still don't make sense to you when you try to understand them in the terms by which you understand yourself, imagine what goes for people who could only be people, in a sense, presently unfathomable to us. Now that quandary might seem to doom us in our efforts to know who or what may lie at the origin of genuine UAP. Yet I'll argue today that the difficulty we face in imagining, anticipating, and perhaps eventually understanding such non-human beings also can be the condition that enables us to begin to do all those things and perhaps more, provided that we proceed reflectively and also very cunningly. 
This is to say that recognizing that the starting point of our efforts to conceive these others is in some way the wrong one, at least allows us to examine and contemplate that starting point, to ask what it is about our own concepts of ourselves and the universe that prevents us from gaining insight into what so-called NHI might be like. What I'll offer for your consideration today is that it's not just anthropomorphism in general that is the problem, but a very specific anthropomorphism, that of modernity, the modern era, the now planetary historical era and corresponding cosmology and ontology that arose in the 17th century. And we can begin to see this by considering other human anthropomorphisms, those of people who are not entirely absorbed into modern patterns of thought. In other words, we can better conceive of non-human beings by first attending to them, not by attending to them, but to attending to human beings and the divergences in their thinking. So to show this, I want to show you first how the modern character of our thought determines our thinking about UAP and NHI. And second, I want to show you the advantage of another kind of anthropomorphism for thinking about these things. Now, despite the lack of social consensus we have about whether UAP are vehicles of non-anthropogenic provenance, I'll presume today for reasons of time that most of us here agree that they indeed are on the basis of certain UAT, UAP data, such as the Blue Book cases, uh, the materials gathered by classic researchers such as the Lorenzins and Jacques Vallée, and the publicly available reports among those analyzed by the UAP task force. Rather than enlightening us, however, this data leads us right to the quandary I've identified. Any confidence that we gain from accepting the data comes with a price, which is that it gives us the illusion that the nature of UAP vehicles and so-called NHI could somehow be self-evident. The trouble is, as the first part of this talk I'm going into now shows, we're conceiving both NHI and UAP through certain human, very human categories that seem to be fundamental to us in the modern age. And this leads us into an anthropomorphic loop. Now in saying this, I'm not referring to the well-known problem that certain UAP events are so bizarre and even absurd that they seem to belong more to the realm of visionary religious experience than any kind of tangible reality. And for that, bring us, for that reason, bring us to the edge of our concepts. That's certainly an essential aspect of the enigma of UAP, and it thus has to be dealt with. But there's another more immediate dimension of the problem that has to be considered first. This is the issue of whether we even have the right concepts in the first place by which to make sense of a non-anthropogenic vehicle, and by means of it, NHI. It might seem perplexing to hear that UAP might not be intelligible to us, so I would ask you for your patience as I explain what I mean. The problem is not, as some of you will no doubt object, that witnesses are not often observing objects that are somehow technological. That's evident enough for several reasons. Nor is it, however, that the objects are somehow so far beyond our categories of thought that they cannot be technological. The problem instead is that the very concept of technology may prevent us from understanding UAP vehicles and their significance. This is most obvious of the longstanding and recently repopularized view that UAP effectively are largely or only technological. According to different versions of that claim, unidentified objects could be nothing else but fabricated machines in a familiar sense. That is, they could not be also partly biological or quasi-biological or even noetic entities, entities of thought. Um, and it's also said that they could only be profitably, uh, they could only be investigated as machines due supposedly to a lack of sufficient evidence by which to substantiate and inv investigate their other possible dimensions. Either way, UAP vehicles are then studied and conceptualized only in nuts and bolts terms as though the psychological, noetic, and potentially political aspects of them evident in so many close encounters are either fantasies of witnesses whom we otherwise believe, or somehow facts too embarrassing to be mentioned. Yet even if we try to compensate by expanding the range of acceptable aspects of the so-called phenomena to include not only technology, but these other terms or facets, the fact we started with technology without asking ourselves what technology is prevents us from contemplating how those other concepts might be usefully applied. It becomes too easy to speak, for example, of UAP technology 
as though a machine could comprise a single technology, as being tens or hundreds of thousands of years ahead of contemporary technology, if technology has neither been defined nor understood to be developed along discontinuous trajectories, to not fall into partially incommensurate kinds, and to not combine aspects of instruments and devices from multiple periods, once we've thought about technology that way, nothing noetic, nothing biological, and nothing political reported in encounters or reasonably inferred from them can be taken even partially for granted. We assume, for, we assume, for instance, that any cognition evident must be AI or the potential life must be artifice. And that leaves us applying these categories to humans in the most uncritical manner. We go, for instance, from being a species to a species among others in a zoo. Our cognitive and intellectual life is imagined to be utterly primitive and our politics is deemed meaningless in comparison with that of beings supposedly greater than ourselves. In short, it's not just that widely reported aspects of UAP events and potential aspects of NHI become eclipsed if we assume that it's obvious what technology is. It's also that UAP and NHI become symbols of things we assume about ourselves. This is to say that we draw unwarranted analogies and comparisons between ourselves and the unknown beings to whom we attribute UAP. And then we believe we've achieved some kind of understanding of both ourselves and them, even though it's clear that we lack even the first idea of the similarities and differences between us and them by which to draw those analogies and to make those comparisons. In the absence of the right concept by which to conceive of the vehicles, we project outward a poor picture of ourselves, and then we take it for a rich image of NHI, and then ourselves. Now, as much as our misapplication of the concept of technology causes us to fall into this sort of anthropomorphism, it is not the only concept of ours to blame. Most, if not all, of the concepts that we believe to correspond to a fundamental aspect or mode of being lead us to the same place if used to master the phenomena, whether physical nature, life, consciousness, history and society, politics, the supernatural, or fiction. Each one of these concepts in the versions deployed in public and even intellectual discourse on UAP is also usually too ill-defined to illumine the data from witness reports and too ill-conceived to enable us to draw insights from the other concepts and make anticipatory comparisons. This is most evident with the concepts often favored by proponents of the view that technology is merely an aspect of a broader UFO, UAP phenomenon, which are the concepts of the supernatural and consciousness. Almost the antithesis of the technological view, this perspective is that the sorts of psychical and even noetic phenomena that are often part of UAP events indicate that the vehicles emerge from an understanding or order of reality so beyond that of physics as it is normally interpreted as to be supernatural or intangible manifestations of consciousness. That may seem justified enough in the case of some particularly anomalous UAP events, but then vehicles that so much evidence indicates to be physical are often conflated with gods, with angels, demons, and other ostensibly supernatural beings and sometimes even imagined to be illusory. Human beings are then conceived of as little more than subordinates of these higher consciousnesses, impotent beings unable to do much more than wonder at what the gods might be up to or hope to be blessed by the just among them with enlightenment. It should go without saying that such effectively supernaturalist conceptions of UAP and NHI are no more helpful and sometimes less scientific than their technologist rivals. You might say that I'm dealing only in extremes, but many notions of UAP and NHI that may seem to be more moderate are equally reductive and anthropomorphic. The less technological but still physicalist conception of UAP and NHI put forward by proponents of the extraterrestrial hypothesis tend to rely on everyday intuitions about biology that either render NHI more morphologically commensurate with us than they are likely to be, including by locating them ahead of us on an evolutionary timeline imagined from our point of view, or by making them utterly and unthinkably alien. 
The same goes at a social level for political and economic notions of NHI, which presumed that NHI would be organized into, into a sort of galactic United Nations, and even worse, that their intentions are so commensurate with those of contemporary national governments as to concern resources, territory, and power as we understand these things. As for the new conception of UAP as legal entities, it avoids these issues by giving us something more concrete to think about and even a clear route toward proof, but it also thereby largely restricts engagement, not just to the commensurate, but an entirely human aspect of the objects. Their status as a historical and political matter on which there's a history of secret US government interaction. That is, the legal notion conflates inquiry into UAP with investigation of the US government. Then there are fictional concepts of UA, UAP and NHI, which confine them to being entities of the imagination, and thus often put us at a remove from the data itself. Now I could go on, including by outlining the way our conceptions of subject and object determine these prior choices and lead us to some very crude thinking. I'll confine myself, however, to saying that the, the, the use here of these concepts, that we as moderns, children of the modern age take to be fundamental, almost invariably result in anthropomorphism. In several of the cases I've sketched, UAP and or NHI are conceived in terms of one or some of these concepts, then used as a point of reference to, to define human beings. And humans are after that used to draw anticipatory analogies with NHI and make comparisons. This quiet and unconscious anthropomorphism, anthropomorphism makes me think that most of us have barely begun to imagine what a so-called non-human intelligence might be. Now, the point of this broad criticism is not to play spoil sport with our intellectual reflexes, but instead to offer a proposal for how they might be deployed differently. It might seem that the easiest way to do this would be to take a holistic approach to anticipating the character of NHI by, say, using all the prior concepts I've discussed to make sense of the encounter data and seeing which of them yields the most fruit. That might seem reasonable on the surface, but it most likely will serve to confine us to the anthropomorphic loop in which we already find ourselves rather than reach beyond that, reach beyond it. To reach beyond it, we need to take distance from our concepts thinking from another human position and another human perspective. Let me now, in the second part of this talk, demonstrate how we might think differently through an ontology different from that of modernity, that of the animism of certain indigenous and other human collectives. Now, if I want us to take this turn, it's because sociocultural anthropology, and I'm an anthropologist, thoroughly demonstrates the historical and social peculiarity of so many of our concepts, and on that basis, the misunderstandings of other peoples and other times that those ideas engender. That's a commonplace within the field I come from, but that doesn't dis diminish its power to enlighten us here. Since at least the German social theorist Max Weber, anthropology and other fields in the social sciences have been aware that the historical epoch that we still arguably live in and that begins in the 17th century, which we call modernity, is almost uniquely characterized by its differentiation of human life into effectively distinct domains, from nature to politics to economy to religion to art, domains that were neither entirely recognized nor implicitly present in prior historical eras or until recently other areas of the world, such as China. Such cases show that it is neither necessary nor in inevitable for human beings to distinguish not only between government and the political on the one hand and religion and the supernatural on the other, but between those fears and economy, art, science, and technology. In coming to understand the way that modernity organizes human life and thereby defines the basic modes of being or existence, that's what we mean when we talk about ontology, the humanistic social sciences long ago also arrived at the insight that society is not in essence the same everywhere, but radically diverges in its composition from culture to culture. Having that insight led anthropologists to realize as well that the very ideas used to make sense of those other organizations of society and thought cause us to misunderstand them. 
They saw that less because inquiry into, for example, religion in Rome in the first uh, century before the Common Era shows it to be inseparable and intermixed with politics, and much more because of the intellectual, because of the trouble caused for ideas, uh, caused by our ideas, by much more peculiar intermixtures of institutions and ideas that we consider distinct. The most difficult and challenging such feat of discernment it caused an ontological shock to anthropologists and initiated our ontological turn, as it's known, arose from the study of human collectives, often called animist, and their ontology. Among certain Amazonian, Siberian, Arctic, and other North American indigenous peoples, it is still common to ascribe culture and politics to animals, plants, and even minerals and technological objects and to conceive of them as entirely self-conscious and even human beings, yes, as part of humanity, whatever their external corporeal appearance. This entails that it is foreign to such collectives to believe that there is nature, per se, in our sense of a physical universe in which human beings would be exceptional for being self-conscious, intelligent, and technological. These collectives believe those characteristics to to be the primary attributes of all beings. Now that may sound to us like a cultural understanding of nature, but it goes much further, conditioning the practices of such people so that anything we might call politics, religion, and art incorporates animals and plants and thus does not involve a, a sphere of nature external to society. Anthropologists such as Philippe Descola and Eduardo Viveros de Castro argue that we therefore are confronted in, a, in animism with a distinct ontology in the sense of a broad understanding or implicit conception of everything that is, a way of conceiving of and relating to beings according to concepts different from those of modernity and thereby revealing aspects of beings like the communicative dimension of animal behavior not usually evident in the naturalist or physicalist ontology that prevails in the modern age. Much more than an adjustment of our terminology for other ways of thinking, acknowledging these ways of thinking as ontologies forces us to consider that they are not cultures with representations of reality that are ultimately incorrect because they don't agree with science, but rather that they're distinct, equally insightful ways of assigning fundamental modalities to reality and defining beings. The upshot is that this insight becomes possible not when we reject our modern ideas as useless or wrong, but when we recognize some of their limitations and thus take distance from them. We can see that nature, and the same could go for other concepts in light of ontologies other than animism, is not a universal concept for human beings and begin to ponder the ways it need not be for us. This can happen, for instance, by shifting our perspective and imagining that reality is not primarily composed of inert matter, but beings as or more conscious of themselves than we are and as capable of the sorts of intelligence we imagine to be exclusive to ourselves. This encounter with an animist ontology that makes thought and consciousness primary in the universe makes it possible for us to see that our inverted way of conceiving it leaves little room for a wide gamut of possibilities and actualities that are not in question for other human beings. Now I'm not making, despite appearances, an overly abstract point. A brief encounter with animist ontology gives us a starting point for anticipating non-human intelligence. Let me show how in the third and last part of this talk with a thought experiment, an exercise in conceiving UAP as they might be, and conceiving NHI as they might be in animist terms. Imagine, like some animist peoples have, a universe in which sentience is nowhere near as rare as we assume, and add to it more consciousness than most of us would dare to, and then go so far as to conceive of those instances of consciousness as being as and often more developed and sophisticated than us. That may, that may not give us any clarity about the sort of existence and the kind of cognition that NHI may have, but it at least allows us to better entertain that they can and perhaps do exist. 
move, move next to the formats or modes by which NHI could be embodied. Even if we were not ready to accept that UAP could be manned, they nonetheless are vehicles and thus designed by beings that need devices capable of movement and possibly transportation. And their immediate reality and way of individuating and incorporating in it, I'm speaking of NHI, therefore must be similar enough to be commensurate with our own. Yet some of us are afraid to imagine that reality, that reality is being physical in any way, deeming it more respectable to say that it's peculiar to another dimension, whatever that is, or we re reactively insist that it must be entirely the same as ours. An animist ontology might allow us to better flesh out, so to speak, our images of the reality of NHI by imagining that the physicality of a conscious being need not, need not be organic or even a discrete unified body as we understand it. As animist peoples promiscuously ascribe consciousness even to fabricated objects or such fuzzily individuated beings as minerals and hills the physicality of NHI could be easily imaginable as an organism or some other kind of biological form or a machine or a self-replicating machine, a biotechnological hybrid or a body as yet unimaginable to the sciences, including a collective body. And of course, it could be all those options. All of those possibilities would be conceivable and seem compatible to us were we to hold the animist assumption that the common denominator of beings is intelligently self-aware consciousness and that physicality and embodiment differentiate them. Now, if it seems that this experiment has only speculative value, let's see what happens as we turn to a question that occupies some of us today about whether reported UAP events are intelligible enough to tell us something about non-human intent. In an animist ontology, politics is, as I mentioned, not exclusively the domain of human beings and thus requires treating animals and beings we would deem supernatural as partners to be negotiated with in practices such as hunting and even kinship. Were we too to extend politics so liberally to non-human beings, and I mean the non-human beings of our world, we would have less problem in imagining that beings with capabilities we lack could view us as having agency and thus even some power. And we might begin to interpret encounters with them as asymmetrical rather than entirely one-sided. And if we have asymmetry, I would argue we have politics. Last, our experiment also allows us to see more clearly the error we make when conceptualizing NHI in modern religious terms. Animism treats not only animals, but higher ostensibly supernatural beings as part of politics and a cosmos not vertically conceived. And they thus engage them diplomatically and transactionally, where some of the religious among us might only subserviently or through the interme intermediary of a monotheistic God. Should we dare to entertain the idea for a moment, we might decide that even if the gods are a subject to the contest and violence of politics, then they are not so far beyond our understanding as to be the ineffable stuff of mystery and the, and the beyond, or the source of an influence and even control that we can scarcely fathom, or gateways to higher consciousness. And we might imagine, too, that cunning rather than awe would get us much further in dealing with them. To sum up the results of this thought experiment, beginning from the premise of a universe rich with self-consciousness, allowed us to conceive of NHI generically rather, rather than in terms of a single concept and emulating the animist idea that physicality is not differentiated by but differentiates consciousness enabled us to imagine a range of bodies or material formats for that consciousness rather than just ET organisms, general AI, or no bodies at all. In a word, we have been able to contemplate that NHI could be beings of thought as much as of body, and to avoid rushing to judgment about their origins, imagining them to be too commensurate or incommensurate with ourselves, or attributing to them too much or too little power. We found ourselves able to think all this, not by transcending anthropomorphism, but by recognizing that there are other anthropomorphisms than our own. 
and seen how just one of them enables us to conceptualize NHI differently. In other words, we better anticipated and imagined the non-human by considering a version of humanity. Thank you. Thank you.